you just made a new friend. Bill. We'll call him Bill. You see, Bill is colorblind. Red, green colorblind. Meaning that he can't see those two colors. And Bill just bought two blocks. One red, one green. But he thinks they're identical. In fact, he thinks they're the same color. Now, Bill shows you these blocks and you tell Bill that um, they're different colors. And you can distinguish between the two. But Bill doesn't believe you. Now you're with a dilemma. How do you prove to Bill that these blocks are distinguishable if Bill doesn't believe that the blocks are different colors? So you can't really prove that they're different colors to Bill, considering he's colorblind, and you still need to show him that these blocks are distinguishable. What do you do? Well, you tell Bill to put the blocks behind his back. Now, you tell him to scramble them up any way possible and reveal one block. You will tell him if it's block A or block B. A being red, block B being green. Bill rattles them up, shows a block, A, boom, block A comes out. That's the red one. Bill puts the blocks behind his back again, rattle them up, show you, B, that's the green one. You're able to distinguish with 100% accuracy. Now, here's the interesting thing. Although you haven't proved to Bill that the blocks are different colors, you have proved that you can distinguish between the blocks. Yeah, you've proved zero knowledge based proofs. You haven't really told Bill how you're distinguishing at this point because you can't, he's colorblind. But you've proved with 100% accuracy so far that you can distinguish the blocks that Bill has purchased. Although they look identical to Bill. My friend, you just did a zero knowledge proof. It's a way to prove to someone that you know something without having to show that thing that you know. So let's say it's a password. It's a way to prove to some kind of verifier that you know your password without having to give your password to that verifier. That way you can, well, in a technical sense, you can access some kind of resource without having to have that resource store information about you. Just a piece of uh, proofs that you can utilize to uh, show that you are who you say you are and you know what you say you know and convince this third party or other person in this case that you're right without ever having to show your actual method. Confusing, right? Let me give you another example. You walk in a cave. You go straight down. There are two paths of forks. Now both paths lead to the same thing, but at the end of both paths is a locked door. Now Bill knows that there's a locked door there and you tell Bill, hey, I know the password to this door and I can prove it to you without having to show you that I can open a door. So you'll never see that I opened the door, but um, I can prove to you that I did. Now, Bill's skeptical as he should and uh, he says, go ahead and prove it. So. You tell Bill to wait at the front of the cave, which he does. He waits at the front and you tell Bill, call out A or B. If it's A, I'll come out the right side. If it's B, I'll come out the left side. And Bill goes and plays your game. A, why don't you come out the right side? Boom. Okay, cool. Go back into the cave. You go back into the A fork. B, you come out the left side. Now Bill's confused because you didn't come back out of the cave to go to the left side. You came out the left by being inside the cave, meaning the only way you could have gone to the left at that point would be to walk through the locked door, which meant that you would have to have opened the door. So Bill sees you come out of the left side, B. He tells you to go back in. You go back into B. He calls out A. You come out of A. Okay, well, now you're two for two. Bill is starting to believe that you actually do know the password for this door, but he hasn't seen you open it. So he can't confirm that you actually are opening it. Now you do this a few more times, and each time you do it, Bill gains a little more confidence that you do know the password. And eventually, Bill says, well, I get it. I believe you. You know the password. You know how to open a door. You just won him over. You didn't reveal anything. You didn't show him the door. You didn't show him the key. You didn't even show him the password. All you did was show him a repeatable example that made it hard for Bill to deny that you are telling the truth. That's zero knowledge proof. And it can be applied to IT today. In fact, it has been applied with something called ZK Snark. ZK Stark and other kinds of zero knowledge proofs. So my, uh, <laughs> I lost the light. So I have this whole cinematic thing going on, but I like it. So, uh, let, let's, let's roll with it. Yeah. Back to zero knowledge proofs. It's mainly something that's used in like a blockchain type of system, but who knows? Maybe one day we can apply it to general IT based systems. Who knows? Let me show you a diagram of how it works. In case you're still confused, this should help give you a better understanding of what zero knowledge proofs actually are. Okay. So this is an example of a basic zero knowledge proof diagram. Now it's a lot more complex with this, especially when you start differentiating between the most modern zero knowledge proof 
based architectures like ZK snark and ZK stark. There's a lot more complexity there. There's like second proofs. There is um, transparent proofs involved. And uh, we probably won't go through that in this video that starts getting into the math side of things. And um, we're only cybersecurity here. So I don't really have a need to jump down that path unless you guys uh, wanted me to. Perhaps there could be another video going down that path. But for this video, we just know at an overview, zero knowledge proofs works like this. First, you have the prover, right? The prover sends information to a function, a mathematical function, right? That does some things and makes what is called a proof. So you send information that you know. So we'll say you send a password. That mathematical function takes your password, does whatever it needs to do cryptographically, right? It's a cryptographic function in this case, and it gives you some kind of output. That output is what you're going to use to send over to the verifier because you don't want to send the verifier the information that you have. You just want to send the cryptographic proof for it. So you receive the proof, you send it over to the verifier. Now the verifier receives your proof. Once this verifier receives your proof, they go and perform their own mathematical function that checks and verifies the proof that they received. And if the proof is, we'll say returns true, right? It is successfully verified. Well, they know that you have information that you say, you know, and they believe that you say, you know, it, and they can do this over and over. They can verify it uh, over and over and over. And, and the more that they receive this truthful verification, the more they're convinced that you actually know this piece of information that you're um, running through this mathematical function. That's kind of like how zero knowledge proof works now in like an application kind of setting, the verifier would then, you know, send a message over to like a, an application or something we'll say and tell the application, yep, you are who you say you are because I verify that you know this piece of information based on the proof that you've given me. And the application would just allow you to log in. So in this case, the application actually doesn't have to have access to your password stored in a database, like a, a hash, like in a database. The application doesn't need that. It doesn't need to store any of your information. All that needs to happen is the prover sends information over to the verifier. The verifier verifies that the prover is who they say they are and knows what they say that they know based on repeatable proof proofs that come back true every time right? That whole completeness, that accuracy, things like that. And then the application allows some kind of login, which means that if there ever were to be a breach that occurs in this application, information about that user really doesn't exist. All you have is a proof. Well, you don't even have a proof. You just have verification from a verifier. That's it. Now it's important to know with zero knowledge proof, there is an inherent issue. The issue with that is if this verifier is a malicious entity, well, now they just allowed you access to the application when you shouldn't have allowed access. So this verifier now be becomes a hot point for, you know, people like us hackers, we probably want to attack this verifier in order to gain access to an application in a way that we weren't supposed to have access gained to. Now there are ways to, you know, better secure that whole process around the verification, but it's still a work in progress. In fact, uh, that's still a concern today, but the most modern ZK Stark and ZK Snarks the concerns, there are the verifier. There might be a way for the verifier to um, forge some of these requests or, you know, be malicious. And if they do it in a correct way, or if they do it in a conspicuous way, it's hard to actually know that they're telling the truth when they said they, they verified the prover. So there's a big gap, a big loophole there. But as technology progresses, as we as humans progress, there may be a way to, you know, resolve that kind of verifier piece, almost how like TLS might work, where TLS has this certificate authority that verifies the certificate and deems whether it's valid or not, or legitimate or supposedly safe, because, um, you know, we trust the certificate authority to tell us whether a certificate is trusted, thus being safe. You know, if there's a process that exists out there, kind of like TLS, but works with zero knowledge proof, then um, maybe it might actually work. Maybe. Who knows? Now, we just learned learned about zero knowledge proof, but uh, what, what's the point? What, what, what value does that provide to us? Well, zero knowledge proof is used a lot in blockchain today. It actually does work with authentication, meaning that over time, there's a good possibility that zero knowledge proofs will be a form of authentication for us to be able to, to log into applications without having to actually give that application our password. So we don't have to store our passwords in these systems. And if it's implemented correctly, or if there's a way to actually secure that verifier, zero knowledge proofs could actually reduce the impact of data breaches. It could, which is a good thing, but we as attackers can still find ways to do things like account takeover on verifiers and things like that. Defenders can find ways to make the verifier more trustworthy and secure like TLS. Now it's still conceptual, right? Zero knowledge proof it's implemented in a lot of 
places right now, but as far as it being, uh, you know, part of our day to day, chances are you're not really using a zero knowledge proof and application that you log into. You're still using the API database kind of combination. I mean, unless you're a voter and you vote in the U S that whole voting idea, right? That's technically a zero knowledge proof, but that's also outside of authentication on systems. So maybe that doesn't count. Well, anyways, zero knowledge proof is pretty cool. I stumbled across it on my research a couple of years ago. I love talking about it. I love watching the progression of zero knowledge proofs. I'm excited to see where it goes, but I also know that if this becomes something that is more modernly used, not only will it provide a sense of security for people, but I'm curious to see uh, how we start approaching uh, cybersecurity from the zero knowledge proof perspective, you know, the attacker side of things and the defender side of things. Here's to hear your thoughts. Throw it down in the comment. Make sure you like this video. Subscribe. I got a lot of bangers coming. And if you have a video in mind that you'd like to see, feel free to throw that in the comments as well. I look through these comments. I actually love reading these comments. You guys have some great ideas. It gives me inspiration. Plus, I like to research. So if you have any ideas on what I can go over, throw it down there. I'll make a video on it. Appreciate you guys. Oh, hit that notification bell um, also so you know when I post a video. Pap out.